like to welcome everyone to one of our quarterly counselors at large meetings. Uh, the four of us do this because, number one, we genuinely enjoy it. It's the best part of politics, is getting out and talking with people and finding out what's on your mind. The second reason we do it is that we can't be everywhere in the city, so you're kind of our eyes and ears as to what are the issues that are important to you, what would you like us to focus on when we carry out our council duties. I'd like to thank Councilor Shirley Azak from Ward 7 for joining us tonight. And I'd like to thank Councilor Ann Beauregard in the back of the room for joining us. But I'd especially like to thank Sandy Proctor, who graciously, <laughs> she graciously said, absolutely, we'll be glad to host you. And I'd also like to thank Tom Tebow for extending an invitation to us to come up to BHA property. So uh, I'm Councilor at Large Winthrop Farwell. Please call me Wynn. And the first thing I'm going to do is introduce Councilor at Large Robert Sullivan, and he will introduce our council president. First of all, I want to thank Sandy. I want to thank the Housing Authority, Tim Tebow, I mean Tom Tebow. But more importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you because this is your home and you are inviting us into your home tonight. So I want to thank you, uh, first of all, for coming down uh, and, and to hear you know, what we want to say. But more importantly, what, what you're going to say to us is what really what the gist of this is. But again, I'm Bob Sullivan. I've served 14 years as a council at large in the city of Brockton. Uh, and it's, it's really my privilege to be here tonight. And I told this story a couple of years ago to Sandy when I came here. My last name's Sullivan, right? So Sullivan Tower is pretty easy, right, to remember? But my daughter Grace, at the time, she was only five. I said, honey, I got to go. Daddy's got to go to a campaign event tonight. It's a candidate's night. And she said, oh, where? I said, honey, it's called Sullivan Towers. And she said, we own a tower, Dad? We own a tower? So I'm home. I'm home. This is my tower. But again, thank you so much, and I look forward to the night. These are always wonderful quarterly meetings, and I, it's my honor and privilege to, uh, to announce my friend, my colleague, the Council President, Moises Rodriguez. Well, 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 well. Let me see if I can screw up the microphone, too. Uh, I actually have a petition going to uh, ask uh, for signature so we can change the name of the tower to Rodriguez Tower. I don't think it's going to pass. But anyways, um, as Bob said, you know, um, residents of this city have five counselors. You've got your ward council plus the four of us. Uh, a lot of times well, we hear the ward counselors saying, oh, but that's in my ward. That's in my ward. And I say, well, you know, I hate to disappoint you. It's my ward too, you know. So... Uh, the reason why, um, and I think Bob started this uh, several years ago, for us to have these meetings as well. We do them in the, in the corners of the city because we want to know what's going on in the city as well. I mean, we get phone calls like everybody else does, but a lot of times it's a lot easier when you put face and names together so um, we can do what we can to represent you. Uh, I, I was actually saying, I said something kiddingly, that this is not a campaign uh, event. We're not here to campaign. At least, uh, I don't know, maybe the three of us aren't here campaigning, but <laughs> no, all of us, all of us that are here, we're not here campaigning. We're here because we truly want to hear from you, our constituents. Um, sometimes there's nothing we can do because it doesn't depend on us. Uh, we hear it all the time, how everybody wants their roads done. You know, we don't have the funds to do all the roads in the city. We'll try to do as many as we possibly can but we wanted to make sure that your taxes aren't going way the heck up there. So we can't raise taxes because we're all taxpayers as well. Uh, so we're going to do it within our means. Uh, but, the, but the idea is to do it smartly. Uh, we need to make sure that we're spending the city resources in the right places. And I, I'm pleased to announce that at least uh, the four of us, and I know the other two councilors that are here as well, We've been uh, uh, you know, slightly frugal in terms when it, uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, the city finances. Uh, we see it as our own money, uh, and we feel that it's important for us to, uh, to do what we can to make sure that it doesn't get wasted. What is the fiscal budget of that? Well, uh, we're just in the process of accepting it. This year it's going to be about around $450 million, which is interesting that when I first came into the council, which was about five and a half years ago, 
it was right around $400 million. So it's gone up to $450 million. It keeps going up. It keeps going up, but uh, we need to make sure that your dollars and cents, my dollars and cents are spent, are spent and spent in the right places, and that's what we are going to continue to do. We're going to hold the, the, uh, the administration accountable for every single dollar that comes down the pipeline, and I, too, want to just thank everybody for showing up because it's important. You could be doing something else uh, this evening, but you're here listening to us, but we want to make sure that it doesn't come across as you are here listen to, to listening to us, that we're here listening to you. Take some ideas and some thoughts of whatever you have to give us, to help us, to help us do our jobs a little bit better. So, but I, before I go, I just want to make sure that I leave one thing uh, with you folks. Please continue to believe in our city. We have a great city, a misunderstood city. We don't do a very good job in promoting the good that we do in this city. We've got some great schools, great people living in the city, and I live in this city. I've been here since I was a teenager. I'll continue to live in this city because I believe in it, but I want to make sure that you two stay believing in our city because if you leave, then I'm stuck here by myself, and I don't want to, and I don't want to go through that stuff. I want to make sure that good people stay in our city to help our city move forward, and I'm going to pass the microphone on to uh, my colleague from... Uh, from the at-large uh, group as well. Uh, this is Jean uh, bradley Rampgort. So please uh, welcome our <laughs> counselor as well. And, and remember, they said two minutes. Don't go beyond that. Well, I'm glad uh, Moses said two minutes because he's been talking for at least 20 minutes. <laughs> well, uh, good evening. How are you guys doing? Great, great. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Jean bradley the Winnan Court. Uh, some people call me Jean and some people call me Bradley. But I like to tell people, just call me the guy with the long last name, so that's easy enough. Uh, it is my distinguished uh, privilege to be here, and whenever I'm coming uh, to this story, I always think about one thing. Uh, it's how I'm going to have an opportunity to talk to you one by one, and also to meet my good friend. Uh, I'm not going to say her name because I did not ask, whom I used to work with at Crystal's Restaurant when I was working there as a boss boy. She's back there uh, helping out. So. Uh, my paramount goal uh, has been to serve you, and I say this all the time. I work for you. Um, I am your employee. You're my boss, and nobody else. And it could not be more, much easier for all of us to come together this evening to actually listen to you, and find out, you know, some of your concerns and ideas. And one of the things that I like about this group, as you can see, although I'm the youngest one, but we treat. <laughs> well, I am the youngest one, but it's okay. So I'm 28 now, but I'm about to be 29. So pretty soon. So it, is, it, is, it has been an honor for me to serve you folks. Day one, I promise you that I was going to do my best to make sure that I'm here. I just got back from Miami, just landed from Logan Airport, and I came straight here because I believe in you and I know that this was going to happen. So here's what I can tell you. No matter what you hear, no matter what you say, I want you to believe in Brockton because this is your city, this is my city, and without you, without us, we won't be able to do what we think is best for Brockton. Eight years ago, I said it a lot, eight years ago, you opened this community to me. Eight years ago, you gave me a place to live. Eight years ago, you showed me love. I cannot give up on you, and I will never give up on you. So here's what I just said. Moses said, do not leave, but I'm begging you not to go anywhere, because this is your place. There is nobody else better than Brockton. So for me, whenever I see each and every single one of you, it gives me a reason to wake up every single morning to do what I think is best for all of us, no matter what's going on. And I can tell you that. I will fight for you until the last breath, no matter what. Yes, I might be the youngest one, but let me tell you this. I will fight for you with every piece of me because I believe in you, no matter what. So like they already stated, we are here this evening to listen to your ideas, to listen to your concern, to listen to whatever you have to say. Because you know why? because you have access to us. We are here in front of you, and you can talk to us about whatever you want. So let me just say this before I give the mic. We are your employee. I want you guys to understand that. You are our boss. When it's come down to your tax dollars, we will make sure that every single penny spent accordingly, no matter when and no matter where, because we will not let anything pass by just for the sake of somebody special interest. And let me say this too, I am a taxpayer too, and I don't want my tax money to be wasted. But I know how much, especially you senior citizen, 
been working so hard to contribute to all of us. So someone like myself, who came from who came from Haiti 80 years ago, can actually make a life in this city. So I thank you guys for coming downstairs because I know you could have just stayed upstairs, watch TV, enjoy yourself. I thank you for taking the time to come here because without you, we won't be able to do our job. We are here to listen to you, to pay very close attention to whatever you have to say, and we will apply it accordingly. So I can speak for all of my colleagues because yes, some folks claim that this is my word or whatever. We represent the entire city. And no matter what's going on, the south side, the north side, the west side, the east side, believe it or not, we are included. So thank you so much for coming down, says. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us, telling you some of our stuff that we've been doing. So I believe you will have an opportunity to, to ask each and every single one of us a question that we will be able to give you the answer that you want. Not what you want to hear, but what we think is best for this city. Thank you, folks, and let's do it. By the way, the reason we're sitting down is because we don't want to talk down to people. We want to be a part of the group, and uh, especially for somebody like me who's a bit vertically enhanced. I, uh, I don't like looking down on people. I don't, I don't think it's the right image. Uh, we're going to spend a couple of minutes until probably 7 o'clock, <coughs> excuse me, talking about the different issues that are important to each of us, and then we're going to go to questions and answers uh, from, from, the, uh, from all of you. Um, it's, it's on this, uh, it's on the, it's already on the piece of paper, Ann. Uh, so, we spent a lot of time, the City Council did this past year and into last year, on marijuana. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that the ballot question passed. Sometimes we were criticized for not moving quickly enough, but we spent a lot of time with Councillor Bob Sullivan as chair of the Ordinance Committee drilling down on what are the business regulations that would be appropriate for Brockton and what would be the areas, the zoning areas or restrictions that we would want for our city. So those are in place. Uh, interestingly enough, we have not had, and the City Council is the licensing authority, we have not had anyone come through the Cannabis Control Commission in Boston where you have to go first and then come down to Brockton and apply for a license. So that's pending. I'm sure we're going to have some retail shops. We already have uh, a couple of places up on West Chestnut Street that are involved in the medical, ma medical marijuana business, but it will be something that is coming. It will yield some revenue to the city. How much, we don't know. And it'll be interesting to see if all of the work that we did uh, yields some benefits. Um, quickly for me, I watched the city finances very carefully. I was on the police department in 1991 when 25 percent of the city's workforce was laid off, including 31 police officers and 35 firefighters, and I would never want to see us go through that again. It was absolutely devastating. We lost about 250 teachers, and Brockton really came very close to insolvency or bankruptcy, and were it not for help from our legislative delegation, we would not have been able to bounce back, but we did, and I don't ever want to see us going back to that to that era. So I watch everything we spend, every recommendation that comes through. I try to research and find out is it good policy? Will it yield? It? Will it be a return on our investment? Because all of you fund government. It's very interesting to sit up here. If you didn't pay your excise taxes and your sales taxes and your meals taxes and whatever else you pay, we wouldn't have a city government because that's where the money comes from. Even the state grants come from the taxes that people pay in this city. The lottery receipts come from the fact that people buy lottery tickets and we get reimbursement from the, uh, we get an allotment from the Lottery Commission. So we, we respect you as the people who actually make city government not only feasible but make it work. A couple of other things before I pass it on to uh, Bob Sullivan. Obviously, public safety and code enforcement, I genuinely would like to see the city cleaner. I would like to see us get to a point where I'm not going to get down some street and see junk cars and see streets that are littered with car parts, 
businesses that have too many cars outside their facility when in fact they are restricted. In other words, as Moises said, it's a great city, but we can improve it. We'll never be perfect, but we can improve upon it. And I think having a, a methodical and focused code enforcement program with statistics coming back to us so we know that what we're funding works, or do we need more funding? In which case, we can request that the mayor perhaps put more funding into the police department for code enforcement or the fire department. Schools, uh, <clears throat> absolutely it's important that we have the best possible education for our children. Um, you know, all of us function because teachers took their time to teach us what we needed to know. And we can't take that for granted. So Brockton Public Schools do an outstanding job. Through all of the darkest hours in the city, the schools were always a bright light. And I want to make sure that they get the funding they need. We support, <coughs> pardon me, the superintendent, and that we ensure that we provide our children with the best possible education we can afford. Uh, streets, enough has been said about streets. We do need a methodical, careful analysis of what streets need to be done. You almost have to triage it and come up, I hope, someday with citywide in all of the different wards, what are the streets that deserve priority one, what are the streets that deserve priority two? What are the streets that are approaching a critical stage when we need to repair them? Because I don't want people driving their cars down through city streets. And, you know, my dad used to say that a pint of cream would churn to butter in some streets. We don't want that. I mean, we, want, we don't want people to have damage to their cars. So um, for all of those reasons, we like to work together. We like to work with the ward counselors. <clears throat> and just on a personal note, you know, it, the thing that I like about the council is we're all different. We're different in terms of age groups. We're different in terms of background. We're different in terms of cultural backgrounds. We learn from each other. We may not even vote all the time the same way, but Shirley may say something, and, and I hate to admit it, but <coughs> women, no, no, women have an insightful way of looking at things. I, if my wife is listening, she'll be pleased I acknowledge this. But <clears throat> they do. They have a way of looking at, a way at, a, at an issue that, that we men don't look at it. So she'll say something, I'll learn from it. Bob will say something, I'll learn from it. Moises will say something. Gene uh, uh, Bradley will say something. And then we try to blend all of the information together, and then we vote the way we think is in the best interest of the city. And however it comes out, it comes out. I always respect my colleagues and however they vote on an issue. So. Um, that's it for me. It's a pleasure and an honor to serve with all of the councillors, but especially with my three colleagues as councillors at large. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. And, and um, State Representative Jerry Cassidy had texted me earlier when I was driving over here. Um, he, they're in session tonight at the State House. There's a couple pending bills. Uh, so he won't join us tonight. Claire Cronin can't join us. Uh, Mike Brady and Michelle Dubois, they're all up at the State House. So I told Jerry I would let you know. Um, I mean, when, when just did a really good synopsis and summary of, of, you know, what we're working on, what we're looking for. At the end of the day, you know, you have, like Moses said, you have five of us at any given time, right? There's seven wards, 28 precincts, there's 11 of us on the city council. We meet every single Monday night, the first and third at seven o'clock, we sit as a finance committee meeting. And on the second and fourth Monday, we, we sit as full city council. Um, I've served as the council president on three full years, and then I kind of helped uh, Mr. Ian Airy last year as an acting. But um, a big role that Moses uh, has done is designating committees. And when said it, I mean, I chair the, the ordinance committee, uh, and the ordinance committee is what makes the laws in the city of Brockton. For good or for bad, that's what we do. And, uh, you know, marijuana was a hot issue last year. You know, we did our homework. We did it the right way. You know, some people weren't happy, and... That's, that's fine. They don't have to. I don't, I, I'm not in office to, to make friends. It's to do the right thing. And at the end of the day, I know we did the right thing. And we'll see how that turns out. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be the pot of gold under the rainbow. But again, we're optimistic and we'll see. Uh, another issue that just uh, came before us, and I'll let Moses and Gene talk about it, but um, you, you probably saw throughout the city this, this scattering of signs, you know, stop sanctuary city and stuff like that. And, and <laughs> We spent five meetings on this ordinance that my two colleagues and friends proposed. Sanctuary City is not what the proposal was, and, and I'll let them delve into it. But the, oh, let, me, let me finish, sir. I voted against it 
and uh, Tim Cruz voted against it, Tom Monahan voted against it, and Wen voted against it last week as a subcommittee. Uh, Gene supported it. I mean, he, he, he authored it. But what I will say about it is it violated federal law. There was a section there that did violate federal law. And as a lawyer and listening to our lawyers, we can't support it. However, a lot of communication is being brought up, right? My, parent, my grandparents came from Ireland to Brockton to work in the shoe factories, right? The city has always been a city of champions and, and immigrants, right? That's what it is. And that's really what the good thing is the city of Brockton is. And when said it earlier, I mean, we have some really good people that serve on the city council. All different backgrounds, all different skill sets, you know, and we're trying to make a difference. And I think at the end of the day, we do make a difference. I will say... right now. What's that? I'm just aggravated with what you say, and I just don't like what you're saying. Well, tell me what you don't like. So tell me what you don't like, because that's just, that's. What you're saying it's not right. It's not right. We need to have immigration laws. R right, ma'am. What I'm saying is we what. We need to enforce the immigration laws. We don't need sanctuary laws. cities. It's wrong. It's what what wrong. I'm trying to like what I'm trying to say though immigration. what I'm trying to say first of all I voted against it but it wasn't a sanctuary city proposal but let me just make it clear there was a component in there that violated federal law you can't support it a sanctuary city the definition of a sanctuary city. I'm not for sanctuary cities. Let me be clear about that. But what I'm trying to say is, if you look at the definition of sanctuary city, there could be no cooperation whatsoever with federal agencies. The problem I had with this proposal is that it did have a carve out where you could not work with ICE. I don't agree with that. My colleagues didn't agree with it. And it was sent back unfavorable to the full council. That's one component that we're doing as an ordinance committee. I'm not spewing BS. I'm telling you what happened. That was factual. That's what happened. We don't have to, have to agree, but I agree with you that it wasn't the right proposal, and my colleagues and I can disagree. So I'm not proposing what you said. It's BS. I'm telling you from my heart what it was, and as a lawyer, what it is. Who so proposed it? I, these two gentlemen. So they, they can talk about it. But I'm just trying to tell you what we've been doing. The biggest thing coming down right now is going to be the $450 million budget. When Chris McMillan, who, McMillan, who's in the back, former Ward 7 counselor, and I got elected 14 years ago, the budget was a little over 200 million. So think about that, 14 years, how much it's escalated. We need to do cost containment measures. The city council has done that. The street lights in the city of Brockton were bought for 43,000 bucks. We saved 650,000 year one, 550,000 year two. Then we did the street light LEDs. You drive around the city of Brockton now, it's clear, it's beautiful, it's also a crime deterrent. So these are things that we as a legislative body, not the mayor, the mayor is the CEO, sits at, the, sits at City Hall every day. You just changed the subject. Oh my God, why are you, you sound like you're campaigning up I, there right I, now. I'm just why trying to tell you, you information. Why you, may, you are giving us information. Right, about but the street first lights. of all, the tone of your voice is very, very angry for some reason. My opinion only, and anybody okay. else can chime yeah. in if like to. I mean, condescending. We're, to yeah, thank you. We're I'm not trying to be condescending, ma'am. Excuse me. We're trying to listen to you. Okay. But you got to tone it down. You sound like you're angry. Well, I'm not angry. I'm deaf in this ear, so I'm sorry well, if I'm, I'm loud. I'm deaf I'm sorry if I'm loud, ear. but I'm, I'm deaf in my reading, so I do left, apologize. I'm not deaf in my left ear either. I do Actually. appreciate the fact that it's a $450 million budget. That's due to inflation in any city. Right. Okay. The street lights are amazing. I love them. You guys got them at a ba bargain basement yeah. price, and I'm grateful for that. But you got to <laughs> tone it down. You, I, 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 not because you're deaf, yeah. but because <laughs> you're, 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 the way you're, you're talking to I'm I'm not, the way I feel right now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let yeah, everybody else simmer. speak, and then we could just listen simmer. to questions. So How's that? How, how's that? Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You can call me Bob. I'm not a sir. You represent the city council. Okay. Anyways, uh, I'm actually the guy that uh, that uh, put in that ordinance. I know. And be nice. Let him speak. It is true. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm an immigrant. So am I. Um, and I came here through a petition process that my grandfather put in for my parents to come. Legally. No, no. Hold on. I'm just. Uh, you know what? There's a lot of rhetoric sometimes that we go through on a national level, and sometimes we carry that into, um, it's interesting how everybody basically thinks that uh, every single immigrant that came to this country came here legally. That's not true. 
Ella Simon was, was Ella Simon. Huh? Let me fin let me finish. I mean, is this going to be a one of these discussions? So you already have your mind made up, and you're not going to let me say a thing. Mind's made up. You, you know, so so, but you know, for the rest of the people that want to listen, I'm going to tell you something. This whole notion that immigrants came here legally, there's only two ways you can come to this country legally. Two. Somebody has to petition for you to come, or you gotta marry somebody who's an American citizen. Or you can apply for asylum. You can't. That's not, you can't. That's not how it works. You know, when you hear, when you hear, but you, when you hear the nonsense about why don't just why don't people just apply to become legal? Why don't they just come here legally? Let me tell you something. If you have the option between coming to America illegally or coming to America legally, I can bet you both of my eyeballs that they would pick coming here legally. Because the, the nonsense that people put up with and the way people are treated just because they got that little label is ridiculous. Absolutely. Now this little immigrant guy that you're talking to came here as a teenager. But you know what I did? I wore the uniform to defend this country. I served eight years in the United States Navy. You know, so when you, when you have people questioning my patriotism, and when I signed up to the Navy, I didn't do it because I was getting anything for free, because there was nothing free about the military. There's nothing free about serving your country. We're not talking about you, we're talking about the No, 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 no. I am telling you, in Brockton, get to that. in Brockton, let me tell you something, in Brockton, the people that I, the, the people that I'm, I come from, I should say, or the people that I'm associated with, Cape Verdeans don't come to America illegally. You know what? They don't. There is no border that you climb over, or there's no fence that you jump over to come to America illegally. Yeah, but they're not, they're not the only immigrants. I'm not saying the, I'm not, I'm saying the people that you'd probably deal with or people that you, you're surrounded with my people, now I'm going to my people, my people come here the same way that the Irish came, the same way that the Italians came, the same way that the Germans came. That's how they come, through a process. They go to the consular office, they file for a visa, they're given a visa, and they come. But those are the people. But those are the people that you deal with in this city. That's the people that you deal with in this city, but sometimes what we're doing, we're taking the issues that are happening in California, in Arizona, Texas. in Texas, and we're bringing it to Massachusetts because you know what? It sounds good. I mean, the nonsense that you see with signs that says, no sanctuary city, I as an American defender of this country, as a veteran of this country, I don't want sanctuary cities either. I propose an amendment so that, uh, to a, a, an ordinance, so that victims of crime can get together and discuss crime with the police department without fear of them getting deported. Now, the nonsense is that nobody tells the truth anymore. We don't, it sounds so much better when we just say, hey, we don't want sanctuary cities, instead of diving into what the, the ordinance that was actually proposed. The ordinance didn't say, Criminal people don't get deported. The ordinance didn't say if you commit a crime in this city, you don't get deported. What the ordinance said is that if you're a victim of, what we don't want is people staying home, getting beat up. We have people in this city on a regular basis getting assaulted. People who are in construction, I know that for a fact. They get assaulted for doing the work that they're doing People take advantage of their status and not pay them for the work that they're doing. Now, if you're okay with that, if you're okay with that, that's okay as well because that's on you. But it's not okay with me because if, uh, if I claim to be a law-abiding citizen of this country, then it's all the laws. It can't just be pick and choose which laws you wanted to enforce. An assault on somebody is an assault. And you know, furthermore, you see people who said, oh, but we want ICE to come in and do whatever they want. Now, let me ask you something. Do you have any children? No. You don't have any children? No. But if you, let's say you had, you have nieces, nephews, somebody. 
If you have that, and I assault one of your people, one of your family members, do you want me to pay the price for my assault? Or do you want me just to get picked up by ICE and sent back to Portugal? No, 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 but listen. As a criminal, as a criminal, so you'd be okay with just me getting deported. Just like the one flying one that were picked up two, three days ago in the, in the wing. The what? The 141 illegal uh, aliens. No, no, but what I'm talking about is do you want, it, it makes you feel better to know that ICE is running around picking up people and deporting people. But you don't care whether or not those people paid the price for the crime that they committed. That's the law. No. Yeah. But you don't want them to pay the price. So if somebody if somebody murders a kid, so you so you telling me so if uh, let me ask you something, if somebody from Italy comes to this country, commits a crime, you just want to deport him back to Italy. That's right. And that's it. No pay. Don't pay the price. Don't. Not you can commit murder. So it's okay. You don't want them to pay for the murder that they committed. You just want them to get deported. I don't. As an American citizen. You commit a crime in this country, I want you to pay a price for it. Yeah. And if we're law-abiding people, and this is what, this is what floors me, we, we claim that we're all for public safety. We want to make sure that you know, people who you know, commit crimes pay for their crimes, but you're willing to let people off the hook when they're illegal immigrants. Because let me tell you something, not everybody, I was in Cape Verde about a month and a half or so ago that I went with a, a group from people from the city that we built a church in one of the mountains up there, a Catholic church. And I saw a couple kids that were deported. And you know what? They were living better than I was. They were. So what, 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 what's their, where's their punishment? My whole thing is I'm not against ICE doing their job. You are a criminal alien. You committed a crime. I want you to go to jail. I don't want you to get out, you know, get out of jail free and get on, put on the plane and send back so that I can feel better about illegal immigrants. I don't. I want to see somebody, if you commit a crime, to pay for your crime here, and then we can deport you. But people are using ICE, people are using ICE as a, as a way of dealing with crime. That's not their function. I want the Brockton police to arrest somebody that committed a crime. I want the state police to do the same thing. I want the FBI, DEA, and the marshal services, all those agencies to do their job and enforce criminal law. Once you enforce criminal law, if the person is here illegally or on a visa or whatever the deal is, once you pay your price, then you can get deported. But I don't want it to be used as a tool for people. Think about it. You come from... Uh, you come from France. If they know that you can just come in and take out somebody, you can just take out that person and say, no, 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 get ice, get ice, I want ice, I want ice, so I can get deported, and you're satisfied with that? And then you claim that you're all for public safety, and you want crime enforcement, and you want the police to do their job? That's nonsense. You know, it sounds nice on TV when you hear people saying, let's build a wall, let's build this, let's do that, but you know what, that doesn't fight crime. Crime, crime fighting is fought in the streets by law enforcement. And by the way, you want to hear something shocking? Immigration law is not criminal law. Immigration law is not criminal law. It's a civil matter. That's why they have their own court set up, their own agents set up, and they deal with those issues as they come. Criminal law is fought by criminal law enforcement agencies like the FBI, like the Brockton police, like the state police. ICE is not a law enforcement agency that enforces crime in America. They enforce immigration laws, which are civil laws. It's almost like when you go to Walmart, you know, at uh, 9.55, and you overstay beyond the closing of the store. They can't call the police and have you arrested because you're in the store after closing hours, they can, have you thrown out of the store. they can throw you out, but they can't arrest you. Because you know what? You went in when the door was open, you overstayed beyond the closing hours. Our door is open, let's close it. Uh, you, you're gonna be able to do that? Do you know that the, the, the 19 people that caused 9-11 to happen, one of the worst incidents in our country, didn't come here through the borders in, in the southern border. They came here through a visa process. 
And those people will continue to come no matter how big of a wall you build. The idea is to develop intelligence in the country itself so we can all keep an eye out and make sure that we keep the illegal people and the bad people out. That's what we need to do. Such a huge issue. How many illegal immigrants live in the city? God knows. But I think, I mean, you know, this is something that, um, you, you know, How you would have. fiscal money goes to illegal people? Zero. Nothing. Zero. That's baloney. And I'm telling you that. Zero. Because you know what it is? This is another nonsense that we hear nationally. Do you know that in order for you to come to this country and get food stamps, you have to be legally in the United States for five years? Whoever is telling you otherwise is full of it. In order for you to get food stamps, you have to be here legally for five years. No illegal person in this country gets money from welfare or food stamps. No illegal person, housing as well. Their children who are American citizens might, but the illegal person doesn't get housing, doesn't get food stamps, doesn't get money from anybody. So if, if those people are selling you that and you're willing to buy it, you're willing to buy it? Good for you. But I'm telling you the truth. The fact is... That's nonsense. That is nonsense. I don't know where you're getting those numbers from, but that's nonsense. But the idea is that I, I just wanted... I just rattled off some things for you so that you know. Again, I'm not, I'm not here to change your mind or, you know, you want to build a wall that's 40 feet high? Build one that's 80 feet high. Build one that's 100 feet high. Why? They come by plane, right? But, but no, but you know what? That's the nonsense that we talk about. The, the people, again, that did us harm on 9-11 did not climb a fence. They came through the airports with carts picking them up and doing the things that they are, and they'll continue to do that because they come in through a visa process. That, you want to deal with the immigration issue? That's what we have to deal with. Not, the, not, not necessarily the nonsense that you hear in the news all the time. Because the people that are climbing the fence or, or, or coming through the southern border, they're coming in looking to pick our potatoes and do the, the, the field work that are being done on the, in, in California, Texas, and Arizona. Well, you know what? If you believe that, no matter what I just said to you, I'm telling you what the numbers are and what statistics are. And if you believe in that, I can't convince you otherwise. I can't convince you otherwise. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> well, I would like to thank you. Um, yes, I, I have a question. In other words, what you're saying, we would detain the criminal, send him to jail, and then after his term is done, nope. we would uh, uh, send no. him... What I'm saying to you is that that's what I want to do. That, if somebody harms that, my child, well, if who's somebody harms... paying hurts, for that? We're paying for that. Why not just send him so away? So you don't want justice for my kid? So what's I the want justice what's for who's done, the, what's the who's justice been done for my wrong. Kid? What's the justice for my kid? It is justice. If he if, if he he's harms, not here, just kick it, just send him back to France. He's, a, he's is no justice? good. He's no good. Why should he be here? But just send him back to France is justice for you? Yes. Really? It's yes. not for me. As an American citizen, as a he veteran of this country, citizen, it's not justice for but me. But he isn't a citizen. I want him to go to jail, and once he gets his time down, then get him out of the country. Who's paying for it while we're in jail? The same way that everybody gets paid in jail. You commit a crime in this country, you should go to jail. But you know what? That's not. And I'll tell you another thing. Refugees get everything from the day they come here. Um, they get food stamps. They get housing. They even get Social Security when they haven't even worked a day of, in, of their life in this country. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something about what you just said. And of course, I would like to go back to immigration. Um, well, we probably just met. But um, here's what I would like you to know personally. I myself worked for the state for about six years. And I myself been a US citizen for two years. And look at me now. I'm serving you because of what you've been doing. Here's but you're legal. No, 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 let me just, let me just finish my point. Um, I came in this country, yes, legally, by virtue of my dad in 2010. And when I came here, I came with my green card. And the green card is a possibility by the U.S. Right. government that allows you to come here right, if fine. you are under uh, 
Uh, can I just finish? If you are under 18, by virtue of your mom or dad or whomever is bringing you to this country, you can be a U.S. citizen automatically. But your parents must be a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. before that age. But once you pass 18, going to 19, you're going to have to do it on your own. So when it's come down to um, undocumented people taking advantage of our... I've got to stand up to say this. When it's come down to undocumented people taking advantage of us, I can tell you that straight, that's not true. I work for, Senate, I work for State Rep Brady as a legislative aide. I work for State Senator Michael Brady as the Director of Constituent Services. My job was to actually work in collaboration with different agencies to help his constituent, the second Plymouth and Bristol District. I can tell you that for my four years working for State Senator Michael Brady, I cannot count on my hands one person who's undocumented that called the office looking for help. I'm going to tell you why they can't. In order for you to be qualified for those kind of service, number one, you must have a social security number. Undocumented people, I'm telling you what I've done. This I is know not, from firsthand experience. Well, I know, but I'm just telling you, I quit the job. I quit the job for a special, I quit the job. I believe it was April 3rd for a reason. I'm not going to mention it here because I think that's not what I'm doing now. I quit the job solely to focus on a different venue. But I'm telling you, I was in charge of this part of Senator Brady's office. And the folks that call the office are folks that were born here or either came here legally, know the system, and they know how to use the system. The undocumented people are unqualified, not just for food stamp or myself or whatever you want to call it, even for student loan. I'm, I'm, I'm helping you out. Right, the I'm thing listening. is that without having a social security, because I'm going to talk about immigration because I went through it myself. So in order for them to be qualified for this kind of service, I myself, let's say that somebody called for food stamp, right? The first thing I ask, what is your social security number? That's number one. If it's a no, done deal. The number two question, what is your date of birth? That's number two. Number three, where do you live? That's what I was doing for four years. The reason I said that is because when you call DTA, Department of Transitional Assistance, they want this information in order for them to log it into the system. If you don't have that, you cannot receive anything. But here's where it's tricky though. If you came here undocumented, I do not believe anybody came here illegally. There's no such thing like that. And I said it. Unless you are a Native American, you can tell me a different story. But that's a story for another time. But what I would like you to understand is that by virtue, it's so funny though, now we're talking about immigration. Because immigration is not our responsibility. The folks in Washington DC should have done that for you. But you know why? You have us here because we are willing to listen to you, to serve you. And I said it earlier, I am your employee. You're my boss, I work for you. You can talk to me whenever you want. As you can see, our cell phone, I hear on that piece of paper, you can call us at any given time. So let's go back to undocumented people. If somebody came here undocumented, so that's okay. If somebody came here undocumented, they have kids here. Their children automatically become U.S. citizen. Right. Right. Their children is able to receive any kind of benefits that this country can offer, either my kids or somebody else's kids. By virtue of their child, they will be able to benefit from that from that aid, uh -huh. either food stamp, myself, and they don't just give it to you. You must be qualified for it in terms of like how much money you make. Let me tell you, I was working at Crystal's restaurant myself. I was going to Master Sweat. I'm telling you a story that I went through. And like I said, I've been a U.S. citizen for two years, and I've been in America for eight years. So when I was working at Crystal's restaurant, I was making $15,000 a year. I would like you to pay close attention because I see that you want to learn and you want to know something. As I was going to Master Sweat, I work with Karen over there. She knows it. I was doing Buzz Boy. I was unqualified because the government stated that because I made $15,000, I couldn't receive any money to go to school. So I ended up taking a loan for Master Sweat Community College for $10,000. So I am a I came here legally, I got my little green card and everything, but I know people that are here undocumented, they would love to receive loan from school. They can't 
because you must have that piece of document which is designed by the U.S. government. Immigration is not a local issue. It's not a state issue in terms of like us having the power to determine. The folks in Washington, D.C. should be able to talk about it. But we do talk to them. And when we talk to them, we report to them your frustration. What I would like you guys to understand is that there are so many people out there talking about immigration. Immigration is so complex because the thing is that in order for even myself to become a U.S. citizen, I had to study, I had to take a test, and you have to pass the exam and determine whether or not you don't have anything stupid on your background because you must pass that. So we're not going to take this evening to talk about immigration because that's not why we are here. We are here to serve you. We are here to talk about what's going on in the city of Brooklyn. To this gentleman back there, here's what I would like you to understand. That sanctuary city thing, I was the sender of it because somebody made a statement March 28, 2019 for a special reason. And he or she knew why they did it. And here's the thing, the paramount goal of this ordinance, although we disagree at a certain level, that's why you voted for us, because we have to be able to talk and also see things differently. Just imagine I see things the same way Wynn sees it, the same way Bob sees it, the same way Moses sees it. This government would have been meaningless. But what I would like you to understand is that the paramount goal of this piece of legislation was to bring a sense of trust and confidence among all of us. Let me tell you why. In Massachusetts, there's this saying, if you see something, say something. Here's what I would like you to understand about criminal justice. I studied criminal law in college. When somebody doesn't trust you, understand that. If somebody does not trust you, they will not share any information with you. And you cannot possibly live in a society that functions like that. And as we speak, we know that you are people, especially women, who are facing domestic violence in this city, being abused because they know that they are undocumented. And you know what's so funny? The folks who are abusing them, saying that if you do pick up the phone, call 911, you will be deported. So by bringing fear to their mindset, they are unwilling to do so. This was exactly what Moses and myself, and I think all of us, would like to accomplish. We would like to give them a sense of belonging and being able to pick up the phone at any given time, report crimes, regardless what it is. I could have cared less, I can tell you that. I am a US citizen, like you are. Whether you were born here or I was born in Haiti. The same flag you praise, the same food you eat, we eat the same thing. But what I will never tell you is that I'm not gonna just sit here and telling you that I was gonna think otherwise. That ordinance, I was proud to support it. The folks that call it whatever they call it is just a political tactics to build on a foundation to determine what's going on. Sir, I'm not gonna keep on talking about this. You can talk to me afterward. I'll be more than happy to sit down and talk to you. Us do not believe in bringing criminals, murders, or folks who are doing bad things to this place. We are not. How could you possibly think about someone like myself? You opened the door for me eight years ago, and now I would have the courage to welcome bad people to hurt you. This is common sense. And like I said, the paramount goal was to bring a sense of safetyness among all of us. And I am a member of a task force that was created by um, DA Cruz. It calls Operation Street Safety Community. What we do in this, we talk about what are the ways in which we can possibly bring folks like you together to talk about helping our community, my community, your community. But people will make you think otherwise. They will tell you that, that we are trying to bring criminals and all that nonsense. So I would be more than happy to talk to you after this because you can see immigration is very sensitive. Let's talk about. If you're here illegally, you're already here. Counselors, counselors, and people, we shouldn't be talking about a national issue. We need to talk about some Brockton issues. Okay? Yeah. So, so listen, it's 730. That's why we're here. I do want to recognize two people. Dennis Ianeri from Ward 3, the Dean of the Council is here, and Steve Hook, who's the Brockton Air Emergency Management Association Director. But that's, again, at 7.30, it's an issue, but the mic's open. Let's talk. Hi, good, good evening, Councils. I just have a couple questions. One is, um, I have a friend that's having an issue with a cemetery in Brockton. Um, I've, I've been made aware of the fact that it isn't I've been made aware that there's an issue at a, I've 
can wait. It doesn't project. It does, okay, it doesn't work. Okay. It's just Don't yell at me. <laughs> I'm doing the best cemetery I can. Issue, right. Cemetery issue, yes. There is a cemetery in Brockton. Apparently it is owned by, can you help me in the name of the people again? Uh, St. Patrick's Church. St. Patrick's Church. Calvary. Calvary. Okay. Has, right. Does it or does it not get patrolled by right. our Patrol. patrolled at all? Is the city responsible in any way, shape, or form for security in that facility they drive, there? They drive through that cemetery. Yeah. Okay, because my friend went there to visit her mother, who's rest in peace, and found several people committing sex acts there. Um, other people were doing drugs there. And somebody buried a dead cat over her mother's grave. Right hand to God, people. She, she couldn't be here tonight to speak on, I mean, it, it, it's making me emotional because who does that? Who goes into a cemetery and buries a cat over someone's mother's, anyone's grave, not even someone's mother, you know? I want to thank you for the street lights. I love the street lights. I could use a sweep on Fuller Street, a street sweeper. Can I get a, a street? Yeah. I can't say it. That would, Fuller, can I get a sweep? Yeah. This poor guy, can I get a sweeper? No. She's not here. Kingman Ave, I'm sorry, Kingman Ave. Kingman. Kingman. On the left side of the city. That's my side. East side's best side, don't you know? Thank you. Yeah. By the way, if, if someone has an issue like that, Please, yeah, A, awesome. contact your ward counselor, and B, what about put it. The new C, click fix. At the police station. What's that new gentleman that makes a lot of money at the police station? Can I call him? <laughs> they all do. They all do. Which one do you talk about? They don't do all of Yeah. That's him. Is this one yeah. person for the police department? I can contact him about this? Yep. Yeah, and he can pass it on to the police chief. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I was thinking tonight, are we going to have any interesting topics? Boy, was I. Uh, <laughs> you know Natalie. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dave. Uh, recreational marijuana. Um, the Cannabis Commission two and a half months ago stated that coffee shops, they'll have their ordinances in place by the end of July. I was wondering if the City Council, if the Ordinance Committee plans on putting some ordinances in place prior to then so we don't have to put a moratorium in place again. <clears throat> well, it's, it, we've done, we've, yeah. well, that, that's the other part that Massachusetts voted on. We voted on recreational dispensaries, grow ops, and coffee shops. That's where you come right into the shop and you consume in the shop. Massachusetts voted in favor of that, and Brockton did as well. Yeah. I, so I, if, where we've already put so many ordinances in place, it seems as though if we only, like, have left is um, locations, the zoning, maybe the times, noise control or something. It's probably two, three, maybe four ordinances plus all the other ones. And I think we could have it wrapped up in two or three meetings. I, I'm just going to speak personally. I'll let the, my colleagues speak. I'd kind of like to get the marijuana business rolled out to see what effect it's going to have on the city, see what resources might be required from the police, for example, for traffic control or compliance, and before I embraced the next tier or the next level of marijuana, uh, because eventually I understand they're going to be marijuana bars where you can actually uh, go in and uh, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to try to find out where we are before I jump to the next level, but that's just my opinion. I don't know about my colleague. Well, they've already been approved. In, in Nevada, in Las Vegas, they'll be opening them soon. So maybe we can like research what goes on there, the way we did Colorado and California. It, it, the only, and I'm not against it, I'm not for it. The only thing I would say is, I, I, again, speaking personally, I want the public safety resources in place to take care of our current residents and businesses before I expand on what might be required of the police. We. What Patricia Wright mentioned about Cavalry Cemetery, th there needs to be a more proactive and a more visible police presence in the city. We probably don't have it because we're suffering reduced manpower, our person power now, because we have men and women on the police department. But embracing this new, again, marijuana industry and all that it may have to offer, 
I really want to get some other things, again, my personal opinion, get some other things in place, take care of our residents, make sure we have proactive patrols, preventative patrols, and then take a look at what the next issue might be. So I, I can let anyone else comment that may want to. No, I mean, I think just when summed it up, we also, the, the city of Brockton has their own attorney, right, the city solicitor's office. But under the charter, the city council, we also have our own attorney, Attorney Shannon Resnick, our legislative council. She's the one that helps us when we move through the process. So we'll talk to her about it as well, but I, I echo the sentiments of when. Yeah, I do as well, but I just wanted to make sure you understand, we understand that the licensing authority for anything cannabis in the city is the city council. So this, the, the reason why we did this when we were discussing the ordinance is that we wanted to make it as clear as, as it could be so that everybody, the citizens, have a say in what happens. Uh, so my whole thing is that, you know, you've got absolutely nothing to worry about in terms of where these things are gonna go or how it's gonna go because it's gonna be a, a transparent process. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be as clear as clear it can be and we're gonna make the decision that, that's best for the city together in a sense. You know, I, I know it's a little you know, catchy in the sense when we say we're gonna do it together, but in this case, we're gonna do it together. You know, because we wanted to make sure that the taxpayers and the residents of the city had a say in what happens with, with the cannabis in Brockton and that's why we are probably one of the very, I don't think there's a single community in Massachusetts that actually has the council, the city council, as the licensing authority. And I'm talking about the cities, not the, not the small towns. But as far as the city is concerned, and I've kind of done, I've done some digging and I, I actually haven't found one. So we're, we're basically a trendsetter in, in the sense that we're setting this thing up in a way that the taxpayers and the residents have a say in what these shops are gonna go no matter how it's going to be so but that's going to that's that's actually a process down the road and, and i think as Wynn was saying you know we're going to focus on the six that we have to license uh within you know as they become available uh but the rest of the process we're gonna we're gonna cross that bridge when we get to it i was just asking from a business uh, perspective because um the question's already coming up and do you plan is this should we be ready in four months or should we be ready in a year or four months? Uh, is the council, so if you're, you are planning on putting a moratorium in place, it'll be at least six months after July. I can't, so I can't speak for my colleagues, my colleagues to be honest with you, but I see that as being an issue, a, a thing that we're gonna do because there's no way we're gonna go from one process into, into a next process. You know, it's a brand new council in, in January, but as far as if I, if I get lucky enough to get reelected, you know, uh, that's something that I would look forward to in putting a, a, a stop to it so that we basically can, you know, cross the T and dot the I's like we did with the other, with the, uh, with the retail marijuana. Thank you. Well, David, I would like to thank you for taking the time actually to ask this question. So, I mean, as you know, it's like, uh, I, I believe we'll, like, we'll of course, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I strongly believe um, in transparency and also I, I also know that you know a government without a sense of transparency transparency it's like a bird without wings so what I can tell you is that um, I will make sure that we do everything that we could possibly do accordingly and to making sure you know something like that move forward but as you know we have to take the time to do the research to come up with the best possibility of approaching it because although someone else is doing it doesn't mean we have to do it the same way but what I can tell you this is something that I know it's very sensitive and you've been very passionately about that, but I will do anything that I could possibly do with my colleagues to make sure that when that issue does come to life, to see what we can do accordingly, and hopefully you business people will come down to open your little business and bring revenue to Brockton, because that's one thing that we gotta talk about. What are the ways in which you can actually bring money here? And I wanna bring business in Brockton. But as you know, it's a very sensitive issue, and you see what I did with you know, recreational marijuana, I think I wouldn't change my mind. But let's see what happened. You know, we have to be more educated about that. And then we will make the best decision when that moment comes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you guys for holding this uh, forum for us today. Changing the subject just a, uh, a little bit here. Um, recently, when I, when I sat on the planning board and the zoning board, I voted against um, the Irving Oil gas station that's going on the... Uh, intersection here at Reynolds Parkway and um, West Street and Pleasant Street, mm -hmm. which is gonna be a major development. 
um, at one of the worst intersections right now in our city and probably in the state. Now, I heard that that has been approved, okay? Um, are you guys concerned about that? Because I know when I was sitting on the board, the study that they did, the traffic study that they did was done during May and June, okay, um, at that time there. But they never did it, did that study during from Thanksgiving through the Christmas holiday when you can barely get through that intersection because of all the, you know, that there. I mean, it's actually, if an ambulance tried to get there, through there to go to Good Samaritan, it's going to have a hard time. And on top of that, I'm hearing that there's going to be a development going across the street there where a couple of times we were trying to put a restaurant in there, a strip plaza or whatever, where the little white realtor, um, the building is. Do, do you know what's going on with that, if that's going to come to, and what are your concerns about that intersection being as congested as it's going to be? I mean, you know, Gary, uh, thank you again for asking this question. So public safety is something that I, that I take deep to my heart. But I, I do know that um, intersection, and of course, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, in 2015 or 16, it was voted on as one of the most dangerous intersection in Massachusetts. Correct. And I'm assuming that, you know, if they're going to build that, not if, when they build that gas station, um, they're going to have engineers that will we designed not just that gas station, but the entire platform in terms of like the traffic comes in, in the traffic going out. So this is something that I'm assuming that they will take. Well, the only, don't, not to cut you off, Gene. Go ahead. The only thing that they said they were going to do is they're going to add, coming from the west side there on Pleasant Street, mm -hmm. they were going to add a turning lane to go onto Reynolds Parkway, um, which will hold three cars. Three cars for one isn't enough. Okay, mm -hmm. and they can't really go more than that. At the same time, traffic flies down Reynolds Parkway. If you ever seen it during rush hour, and you know it just any day of the week when people are coming home from work from four o'clock on, the turning the turning lane going into the mall, okay, is so backed up that it's now past the turning lane and it's back out to taking up one of the other two lanes at this point here. So cars have one lane to come down. And then they're going to come. So now this congest this is going to be so congested that you're going to have everyone now cutting through the gas station and going through all the side streets over there off of Pleasant Street to come back out to West Street to, to bypass it. And like I said, I voted against that project, even though it was voted in favor of because of that concern. And I don't see any other way that it's going to happen. So the traffic study was already done. And all they're adding is a, 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 ter a third turning lane at that point there. So, I mean, um, I think, I think a, a bad, a dangerous intersection just got much, much worse, mm -hmm. you know. And then there's talk about building something on the other side there, which is going to add to even a lot more congesting there. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad project. I mean, you know, even as we speak, I mean, if you are driving down from Pleasant, um, cross West Street in that small highway, you right. cannot take a left. And this is something that I do know it's kind of like very crazy because there is right. no light to take a left. Yeah. So you're going to have to wait for that um, traffic coming up to Correct. try to fix it. I mean, I think not just us, but I do believe Senator Brady, State Rep, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassie, and Michelle brought that issue to DOT. Um, mm -hmm. I was part of that meeting. So this is something that I think um, they are working on. I cannot tell you at what yeah. stage they are now, but I do know that it is a very dangerous city. As it you is. know, I live up there. So. Right. If you are going down from, if you are going down from Pleasant Street, you cannot take that left. You're you gonna have to wait left. for the car coming up from Pleasant Street to do it. So I mean, Correct. I truly appreciate your concern, and I do think that my colleagues will express their own feelings. But it is a concern to me. Yeah, I it just think it needs a little bit more. I don't know if it's passed already. You know that it has gonna be been done. passed to yeah. where it's gonna go. As I know. In fact, we just voted on it on Monday. Okay, right. I know uh, that's gonna but go, but. We, I'm talking about the traffic. I, I understand that. But you know what, uh, Gary? There's one thing, I, and I bring this up a lot of times when we are getting together uh, in public safety and some of the other committees that we sit on. We live in a city of 100,000 plus people. And with 100,000 plus people, one thing you can expect is traffic. And sometimes traffic is good. Controlled Chaos, as far as traffic is concerned, is a good thing. It shows that the city is actually developing. People are interested in coming to our city. People are shopping in our city. Um, I, I know it doesn't, it's not politically correct to say, 
But in order for us to develop as a city, and we are the only city in the county, we're not Avon, we're not the Bridgewaters, we're the city of Brockton. Cities like Brockton have traffic, and we're going to continue to have traffic until the city ceases to exist, which I hope it never does. But we're going we're gonna to have that. But we're going to be realistic because a lot of times, sometimes, when we play the political game and uh, we're going to stop traffic, we're going to you know, eliminate all the traffic, we're not being realistic. We're not being realistic, and a lot of times we're playing with people's emotions, and it's not something that's good for a city. And we need to develop the city to make sure that you know, we, we can't continue to crank up the taxes uh, on the on the rate play, I mean the taxpayers in this community. We need business to develop and business to bring uh, resources into this community. I know it's not the the most politically correct thing to say, but you know what? I can live with a little traffic, knowing that my taxes aren't going too far up. You know, it's something that we do. I go into Boston, and you spend a day in Boston just to go one block. It's a good thing. Nobody, you know, in, in Brockton, we complain, we hear people complaining about, ah, oh, there's no parking, there's no parking, there's no parking. You go into Boston, you park 10 miles away, and you're expected to walk to where you're going. In Brockton, everybody wants to park around City Hall. Everybody wants to park around this building. We don't want to walk. You know, it's not the right thing to do in a city. You know, in cities, unfortunately, there's issues that come along with the city. You know, with all due respect to people sometimes that say, I don't want traffic, I don't want people, I don't want noise, I don't, I'm sorry folks, those things come along with the city. I love my city and I don't mind putting up with a little traffic so as long as it's controlled traffic. I just want to say, I'm not against the project. I'm just concerned with the... the just, just for the benefit of people that might see this at home, it went through technical review, it borders Ward 1 and Ward 7. Councilor Azak worked on this extensively. There have been improvements. Mass DOT was involved. They did reach some accommodation with St. Paul's Church, which I believe owns property contiguous to where this will go. The fire department signed off on the underground storage tanks. I don't believe they'd do so if they were at all concerned with public safety. So um, that intersection always should be watched in terms of enforcement, people blowing the light, making illegal turns. But I do have to compliment the ward councilors, Tim Cruz and Shirley Azak, and the, and the city administration for really drilling down on the issues that that, that that particular project presented. So with that said, let's go on to another question. I'm not trying to hurry, but. No, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of things. Uh, my name is Cindy E. Thierakoska. I'm a resident of Ward 5. <laughs> and my first thing I'd like to bring up is historic preservation in Brockton. We have a historic. Um, society here in the city they work really hard but I think that Brockton itself needs to work harder on some of the historic preservation of some of our buildings we have lost so many in the city and we learn from our history just last week the former Hotel Grayson was hit by a car there was a fire it's my understanding that the city owns that building and I'd like to know what the city is going to do to preserve that building so that hopefully someone will come in and turn it into something so that we don't lose another historic building, as well as the building that sits directly across from it on Frederick Douglass Avenue. It's been painted purple, it's unsightly, and it really needs to uh, have something done with that. And we also, our historic um, commission in the city is not um, in place, and I think that it needs to be. I really would like to see the city council um, become quite active in that and um, getting people on that commission that are going to work on the buildings in this city to preserve them. What I would like to see is some type of a checklist so that when someone owns a property in the city, they come to the building department, they may want to put new windows in or, or a vinyl siding. I think there needs to be some type of a checklist if the building is over a certain age, it needs to be evaluated before it's granted um, to have changes made to it to make sure it does stay within any historic parameters that it may come under. And then my next thing, and then I'll let you speak, is the homelessness downtown and the, the drug use. There, um, I know that we have the police department that is doing a great job through community policing downtown, but I would like to see it in later hours. Um, 11, 12, midnight, 2 a.m., there's a lot of activity going on. And I personally do not see the police 
um, able to stop and really like, you know, be able to park, put their windows down to listen to what's going on. I know they drive around, but unless you're hearing some of it because things are happening behind buildings, um, I'd like to see that addressed as well. Thank you. Okay, just for my part, very quickly, we do have a historic, <clears throat> pardon me, historic commission that requires appointments by the mayor. When they are, when the appointees are submitted to us, we do vote on approving them. Uh, homelessness, and actually police patrols. I, I'm just gonna say this. We, we are not in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of city government, nor should we be. We, we are legislative, we are policy making. The mayor and the various department heads are in charge of what goes on. So any one of us can call and request something, we can't require it. We can say we need more p police patrols down in Ward 5 or because of the activity at 11, 12, 2 a.m. in the morning, but we can't, we can't require it. So we're- oh, I understand that. So, so what, what we need is a more proactive approach to these issues. I mean, there should be a laundry list of areas. We do have a crime statistician. We have a crime analyst. So the information that she feeds to the police department should go out to the patrol division so that you know where offenses are happening, what time of day and what day of the week, and then you should gear your police patrols to where obviously you have high activity. Um, we don't get those crime reports. I've never seen one yet. Uh, and I'm not going to launch into I'm not going to launch into that tonight. We need to do a better job, and we need the appointments to the Historic Commission. Um, that's, that's my two cents worth. Of the councillors for holding this meeting, too, for the citizens for coming out uh, and speaking up as as residents. My name is Jimmy Pereira, a resident of Ward Seven. Uh, in respect of everyone's time, I'm just going to talk about two things. Uh, I like to thank everyone for the topics that they did bring up. Uh, those are things that were on my mind as well. But one thing that we've seen is road construction, uh, potholes that continue to be in the city. Uh, something that I'd like to see, I've brought it up before, but looking at the pavement management system, I know it's something that does exist, but looking at how we can improve that, uh, one solution I would think would be the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee or creating a Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. I know some things are not in uh, the City Council's power, some is delegated to the mayor as well, but having that conversation, moving some of those things forward. I'm a father of two uh, children uh, who like to bike in the city, so I make sure that you know I don't let go of their handlebars when I'm walking down Warren Avenue and there are people speeding. Uh, we haven't had any progressive uh, tra type of traffic calming devices here in the city. You see the, uh, the, the Hawk beacons on Montello and in front of Arnon, but that's about it. So uh, I've done it as a candidate. I've done it as a city planner or, or urban planner. Now I'm doing it as a citizen because I'm tired of seeing cars crash into buildings because whether it's potholes or because they're racing, uh, we don't have anybody talking to the people or talking to the citizens about, you know, what can we do? We talk about two-way traffic studies, but that takes years, and we know it's going to take more years. So to throw it into people's faces and say that, uh, we have this study coming down the lane. I'm not directing any to, to anybody, but it's the government that we have, and I want to make sure that we are working uh, with the government and making sure that we are holding people accountable as well, <coughs> but also bringing pro progressive ideas and bringing uh, solutions to the table as well. So with that being said, I'd like to see if we'd be able to talk about a bicycle uh, pedestrian advisory committee uh, or other uh, things that we could do with the traffic commission as well. Uh, again, department heads should be involved as also, so making sure that all parties are included. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, thank you, Jimmy. I mean, we, we as a council could, uh, relative to a commission, I mean, we can't appoint, but we could draft legislation that would become an ordinance, put it on the books, and then ask the mayor um, to follow that through. In terms of traffic and people, you know, smashing into buildings, um, Mr. Yancey was killed on Belmont Street, unsolved murder, hit and run. He was just coming on a break from, uh, from the supermarket. Uh, at that time, the city council, we attempted to lower the speed limit on that street, and we were told by the state, no, you, 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 no, it's a, it's a state highway. We're not going to do that. I concur with you. I mean, we need to figure out collectively, everybody, uh, how to make Brockton Road safer, and it comes with investing some money in it. I mean, there's certain areas of the Brockton right now. Copeland Street was just partially repaved. I mean, there's certain areas that need to have, you know, um, number one priorities and then others not. But at the end of the day, it's, it's safety and, and making sure that your kids can ride their bike. So right. that's a good suggestion, and I think we can take it as a, as a city council and go back to the ordinance committee and work on it. Thank, Thank you, Jimmy. Counselor. Thank you. I yield my time.
have a simple question to ask. Uh, why was it necessary to hire a police spokesman between salary and benefits over $100,000 a year when you could easily hire and put on two fully trained, academy trained patrolmen for less money or the same amount of money? That always bugged me. You have a police sergeant, former sergeant, with Farrell. I'm a former police officer in Brockton, too. Our shift commander was always available. Every shift, the commander would be there if there was any question. Plus, you always had the Enterprise or any other newspaper could go right to the log and read for themselves to any information that, you, that, you, that they wanted. But to hire a spokesman, when we always did it for all these years, over $100,000, I'd rather see two trained police officers that we need on the streets, especially today. Thank you. He said it. Uh, nothing to be said. Uh, but one of the, uh, what I just want to, listen, as I said, nothing to be said. And what I'm trying to say is that, again, that's not something that we did. That's not something that we created. And one of the reasons why I think a lot of these things happen, especially with the police department, is that there's very little accountability from the police to the city council. We don't have any say, at least yet, on who the, who the police chief is gonna be, or who gets appointed the police chief. And you notice I said yet, because we do have some things in the work that will change some of that. Uh, I think um, when, you, um, when you're watching TV and you're watching some issues, for instance, in Boston, the, the police um, superintendent commanders are always on TV answering to a, a crime in the neighborhoods and things like that. That's something we don't have in Brockton because they, they, honestly, there's no accountability to the govern the other half of the governing body, and that's something that we need to change. But the rest, as far as the appointment of the position that you're talking about, we had nothing to do with that. It was put in a, in a way where uh, the option that we were given is basically zero. We couldn't even cut the position from the budget. All we could do is cut that amount of money from the budget, but it doesn't guarantee that the position was gonna be funded to begin with. So we did what we thought we could do, but that's something that the administrator of the city did and he should answer for, you know. But one of the things that we have um, coming up very soon, I hope with the support from my colleagues, is that we're going to change some ordinances in the city to change some accountabilities in how departments, department heads are appointed in this community. And if they're going to be department heads, then they need to go through the whole process like everybody else. And I'm, I'm going to count on my... Uh, on my folks here to basically support that process uh, before we even go further with this uh, so that there's not a great deal of fighting and discussions amongst ourselves because we tend to do that as well you know and, uh, and I think we owe it to the uh, to the taxpayers in this community to kind of work at some things that are beneficial to the people in this community and don't thank anybody for asking the right question well I'm gonna do exactly what you said because uh, as an elected official myself I think we can do uh, whatever the people want us to do. But in regard to your questions, I think that we were put in a situation where we couldn't really do anything in regard to uh, whether or not we want the position or not. But what happened was, I believe it was included to the police supervisor union that was plugged into it. And I myself was actually um, one of the vote that they were waiting for. And when I spoke with a few people, and I think I spoke with the city solicitor, his statement was that if we voted against it, we would have to go through arbitration, I mean, arbitration, and that would, of course, the city more money. Because I feel like giving the situation that we were put into, it was kind of like necessary. But one of the things that I can tell you now that I was not, that I was not, and I'm not happy with, was the fact that I spoke with a few people about that, and the administration stated that what I said, in order for me to vote for a position like that, he or she must speak in other language. And I happened to find out that the person that we give this job to couldn't speak anything else but link, but English. So although we were put in a situation where we couldn't do anything, um, you know, I'm happy the fact that you are not happy about that position. But it's not something that we solely said we were going to do. So we were put into a situation where 
we had to do what we have to do. But I hope, like Council Moses said, when it's come down to making those decisions, especially appointment, as you know, we do not have any power whatsoever to appoint people in the city. We can make some recommendations, but I hope there will be a moment when we will be able not only to appoint, but to appoint the best people to this position so you, as somebody who served the city perfectly well, can truly satisfy about your service and those who are services right now. Thank you so much for taking the time not only to come here, but also to ask that question, sir. Teacher, taxpayer in the city of Brockton. I, I want before I ask my question. I want. Got you. Okay. I have two. I have two thank yous. First of all, before I ask the question to the whole council, the first thank you is, last time I spoke in front of you people, I, I praised Brockton High School. Moses, you talked about the poor image of the city, and I said Brockton High School is the best high school east of the Mississippi, and I still feel that way. I just want to say thank you to the kids for last Friday, Saturday night from putting on one of the most incredible musical performances ever. <laughs> you had to see it to believe it, people. It was really unbelievable. The, the next person I want to thank is Wynn Fowell for exposing what Bob May didn't give the city council on his $250,000 request that would have ended up costing the city $793,000. I think Bob May's got to be a little bit more upfront with the city council on a lot of issues because it's not right and it's not fair. And I want to thank the five city councils who didn't take the bait. Moses Rodriguez, Robert Sullivan, Wynn Fowell, Ian Beauregard, and Susan Castro. I got to thank you five because if, if, they had, if the vote had been the other way, we would have been stuck with that $793,000 right now. Now my question to you is, we have something very big happening June 3rd in Brockton. That's the class action lawsuit against the city of Brockton. It's going to be held at the uh, courthouse, the Superior Courthouse. Now, this is a very big issue because, as you know, Russell Lopes won in front of the MCAD. He then, and the city of Brockton wouldn't pay. Then he won in a court of law in front of a jury trial. They awarded him $4.3 million dollars. We have not addressed it at all. I was hoping the city council would have addressed it by now. Now, I know you know you got to go into executive session, but right now you have to realize that it goes up 5% a year. There's an interest on that. Also, Phil, Phil Nazarella has had an open checkbook on this, and that's not right. There's got to be a time when the city council says stop, pay them in. Okay, because if not, this is going to go on and on and on and on. You're going to have bills like, like crazy. And I'm also hearing, and I hope this isn't true, okay, that the Brockton Rocks owes the city money, and they're going to be allowed to open up before they pay the city the money they owe them for electric, sewer, water. Come on. If we didn't pay our electric, sewer, or water, we would it'd be shut off, believe me, and eventually we'd be brought to court. So I hope that, that the, the Rocks are going to pay their bill before they're allowed to open up. And I hope you people address this Russell Lopes case because $4.3 million is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But I have to say something now. Russell deserves it for what the city put him through. Thank you. Oh, let, me, well, let me just say one thing, and then I'll share the microphone with, uh, with uh, Council Sullivan. I just want to make sure that you know that we are looking into this but we can't discuss this publicly because we can't really comment on ongoing litigation. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the litigation is against the city of Brockton and its governors, which we are as well. So we can't at least comment on that publicly, but all I can tell you is that we have uh, something in the works to address some of these issues. And Dennis, from a legal perspective, the, the only one that can settle a lawsuit against the city of Brockton is the mayor of the city of Brockton. Uh, the city council doesn't have the authority to settle lawsuits. Um, we just can't. It doesn't, it's not within our, our, our auspices. Um, it's a pending matter. Uh, Moses is right. We, we, we've had some due diligence and discussions on it, but we can't get into it. Uh, relative to um, the Brockton Rocks, I, I agree with you 100,000%. 100, they owe a lot of money. 
Wynn's done a lot of homework on that. There's a, a resolve relative to B-21, Brockton 21st century. They've asked, the legal counsel has asked for time. Wynn has granted it as a professional that he is. And uh, we, we, as an 11-member board, are really looking into that because they've taken advantage of the city of Brockton. They really have. And next up, we have a young lady. Hi, my name is Vanessa. I am um, starting a cultivation in Brockton, and I just have a question and a comment. I'm in economic empowerment, and I was wondering why wasn't there a social equity program in place in Brockton for economic empowerment? And then with the social consumption that is coming up in Brockton, I was wondering if you guys were thinking about doing a social equity program within, for the new regulation that's coming up. I, I'm, I'm going to confess I know a little bit about the social empowerment issue. Uh, my understanding is, if I'm right, didn't the CCC just vote that they would give minority applicants preference, first preference for licensing? Yeah, that's the state level, but there's cities all over Massachusetts that have their own social equity program in place but, for but, people who but are. Won't that mean that you'll come down to us first, though? In other words, if you once once you go through the CCC Cannabis Control Commission, then that would put you first in line to come to the city and apply for a license here, because you'd be ahead of everyone else. That's when I put my app. Well, it's <coughs> no for cities. They for to get a host agreement, they have a their own little program for social equity, like people who are not as um, uh, financially stable, they have um, programs for them. Like Boston, they have a social equity program where if you fit in a, um, a certain cri a criteria, it's a one for one. So for every economic empowerment, there's a regular um, person that wants to get a host agreement, they do it that. Or like so, um, just like in Somerville or in Worcester, they have their own social equity programs. So I was just wondering when it came to the regulations that were put in place in February, just like how medical had their own um, priority, why wasn't there um, something for economic empowerment or just a program in place for people who want to get into the marijuana industry but don't necessarily have the funds or the connections to do it? Okay. Because I, I went through <clears throat> loopholes to get my host agreement, like a lot. And compared to if I went to Boston, it would have been a tad bit more easier than what I did in Boston. Have, have you been successful to get a host community agreement here? In Brockton, I'm in the process of getting it. Okay. Are you the young lady that yes. <clears throat> kind of got turned away the first time? Okay. This is not a criticism of the mayor. This is an observation. The mayor is the one who executes host community agreements. You have to have a host community agreement. That's an agreement between the, the chief elected official or the Board of Selectmen in the community in which you're going to locate in order to proceed to the Cannabis Control Commission. We as a council did not even know that the mayor was reviewing potential host community agreements. It was ongoing before we even finished the zoning portion of, of our work. So it, it, both business regulations and zoning. So there was no notice in the paper that if you would like a host community agreement, you have between this state and this state to submit your paperwork to the mayor for consideration. I don't understand that. I would think that given all of the publicity and all of the discussion about marijuana, it would have been one of the most open, transparent processes that you would ever see. Uh, for my part, I favor having local people get the licenses with local people being employed. I'm not interested in... I'm not interested in people coming from out of state with a lot of money and coming into the city and deciding they're going to set up an operation. Uh, it, it seems to me this is a new industry. It should be beneficial to the city and it ought to be beneficial to the people who, who live in the city and contribute to the vitality of Brockton. So um, I will admit I'm going to have to do a little more research in that. You've piqued my curiosity. I do hope you're successful working things out with your legal counsel in the city. Sometimes you can fight City Hall and win. So. Sometimes. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, just to make it clear again, so the, there's there's eight places that are going to come, but there's two already grandfathered in, which are on West Chestnut and Dennis Ianeri's uh, Ward 3. That's the uh, the medical marijuana, and they've been there for some time, but they automatically qualify to get the two. So there's going to be six plus the two. Um, what we've been told is that there's already been 10 signed host agreements. I, I can't figure out the math on that. If this can only be eight, but there's 10, um, and potentially this individual would be number 11. But again, we, we didn't have any say on the host agreement, and uh, unfortunately, uh, cult cultivation, right? But you know, we'll just have to see how that pans out. I mean, I think that uh, the whole thing was, there was a lack of transparency in regard to the whole thing. Like he's, like, like Wynne Fowler said, um, I don't think anybody knew uh, who was going to receive those host community agreement, and I, and I strongly believe that. Um, it shouldn't be like that. I think everybody should have been able to apply. You are not the first one who actually have this kind of issue. But in terms of that social equity, I think it's a wonderful thing. But I don't think it was part of that ordinance that was voted on. But I think it's a wonderful thing that we can... Um, think about in terms of like bringing to Brockton, but here's what I would like to say. Yes, I would like to see the people that live within the city benefits from what we are doing here, as opposed to some people from wherever they come from and get connection and get whatever they want. So I think that lack of transparency is something that I would like you folks to pay attention to, because when it's come down to something major, major like that, you folks should have been able to be able to come and talk in terms of like whether or not you want it. As we speak, I got a call from a lady who believe that there will be a pot shop beside his business where he's having, I think, a daycare. And she's worried about bringing kids and at the same time seeing marijuana. Um, I call it ganja. I think that's the best way for me to pronounce that word. But I think that lack of transparency, it's, somebody, it's something that I'm not happy about it and I will never be, be happy about it. And as you, I mean, I think you and I had a conversation before in regard to you being turning away from City Hall in terms of like trying to find information about this. And also as we speak, I know some lady who lives on West Salem Street. She said that she went to City Hall at least four or five different times. And she was told that nothing was going on. And when she went for the seventh time, she said that everything was over. So I think the residents of Brockton deserve better. And we as the legislative branch, policymakers, we do not have any say in regard to um, the community host agreement. But what we can tell you is that what's so pretty, we have the power to determine who's going to get those licenses. That's one thing that you got to be able to understand. We will make that final call. Although 10 people are in the process of finalizing it, but the 11 of us will be able to vote in terms of like who is going to get that. Although Bob just said it, two people, I mean two business will get it automatically, given the fact that they have been here for a little bit. But the other six, although, I mean, as we speak, there's 10 and Potentially, there will be um, a, um, a 11 one, but the license will be determined by us. And I think it was Bob and, and Moses and Wynne Fowell that make that call to determine, okay, well, who was going to be in charge of giving this license, uh, this permit or license away. Just imagine if we did not have that, this control, this thing would have been a mess. But fortunately, given the folks that we have on the ordinance committee at that time who draft legislation and make sure that you folks we'll have people who truly understand the complexity of giving those licenses away and make that conclusion. Fortunately, I will be one of them. And we will be able to vote, not only vote for the sake of voting, but voting for the folks that we believe will be able to bring business in Brockton, but also giving back. So I hope uh, you succeed in the process of getting that, 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 that community host agreement. And if not, you know what? We're going to be here. We're not going to go anywhere. But I hope next time we have an issue like that, the resident is able to participate in determine who's going to get what and when he or she's going to get it. Thank you. Uh, I think I think Wynn wants the microphone because uh, we were told that we're only right. supposed to be here until 8 o'clock and uh, Counselor, you know, my buddy here has taken so much time. No, you can go ahead and ask your question. No, go ahead and ask your question and then we're going to pass a hat for so we can make a collection so we can pay an extra stay 10 minutes. Extra, stay a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, the last girl that was speaking w was right uh, as far as um, the programs that are available um, for this industry. The industry is huge. The, sta the state says it's going to be uh, uh, $1.2 billion once it's up and running. City of Brockton uh, should be taking in a lot of money once it's up and running. What other cities um, are doing, are they're putting um, a cannabis commissioner in their town, uh, or a cannabis czar, 
you know, someone that can take and work between the, the um, council and, and the mayor's office. So that way, every day there's new postings on the cannabis site, you know, and the council and the mayor, no one keeps up with it and no one knows what's available to us. We kind of, the city needs somebody to take charge, someone that the industry can go to, someone to help us, you know, just to get through it quicker. The quicker we get through it, the quicker the money comes into the city. Now, you know I have a crazy sense of humor. Would that be the high commissioner by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd ask. I Call it as you like. Okay. <laughs> But, but it's a great position, and, it would, and, and what it would do is the city would be prepared. The, uh, you know, we're kind of missing out on a lot of stuff just because we're mo moving kind of slow on it. But if um, someone would work with the people trying to get into the industry, and, and that's why you haven't heard from anyone yet. It's really tough to get through the city. No one has answers. The police department don't. The fire department, I, no one right. knows anything. You're right. There were ordinances yeah. put... On, on the list, and no one has taken control of being in charge of that ordinance, and there's no one to find someone to do it. We kind of need someone to take P charge. Po points well taken. And, all right, it's, it's 8.15, so I'm going to kind of do a wrap-up. Um, the reason we enjoy this is we don't like politicians that show up every two years when they want something. I think it's important to listen to different points of view. I think it's important to listen to the gentleman out back who has some passionate beliefs. I think it's important to listen to people who offer comments, criticisms, suggestions. Uh, that is part of politics. I will say this, I blame the Congress and I blame multiple presidents for putting us in the position of having immigration issues still fomenting around this country. It goes way back to Reagan, it goes to George H.W. Bush, President Clinton, President Obama. It's not a city issue. We need to be focused on accountability here and how we spend our money, getting safe streets, repairing roads, having our schools be the best they can be, and ensuring that the quality of life for our residents is exactly what it should be. So we will hold another one of these in about three months. Uh, I'm not quite sure where it will be, but everyone is always welcome to come, and w we are sincerely honored to serve you. Um, you're the whole reason we do this. It, it's, it's, there are very other few rewards other than making new friends and listening to people and learning from, from people who attend these meetings. So I thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Uh, Gary, you want to close yeah, it up? Uh, when I just had one question. Um, I'm not sure if it was a city council meeting or an ordinance committee meeting, but you had brought up the subject about the donations to be made to char charitable under the cannabis companies here. Um, I, I've called a few of these charities that I'd like to make these contributions to, seeing that I had two host agreements delivered to me for cultivation and manufacturing. So I called up the institution who I'd like to make the donation to, which is a renowned place here in the city of Brockton, without mentioning their name and they told me they couldn't take anything um, from their board of directors, their bylaws, um, from cannabis or anything drug related, uh, even though they know that cannabis now is becoming a medical miracle to a lot of things. Um, and they'd love to take my money, uh, 25000 each year for three years, um, but they can't uh, directly from my company. So you talked about the council maybe uh, setting up some sort of funding, um, some sort of account that we could donate to that you could distribute this money without it going into the general fund where it could be distributed at the mayor's uh, discretion or, or the council's discretion, whatever discretion that is out there. But I'd like to be able to have somebody that I could depend on that the money that we do donate go to the charitable organizations that we wanted to go to. That's okay. basically what I want to know. Gary, I'm not exactly sure what nonprofit organization you're talking about but I'll there's you, it's teen challenge there's about probably a thousand nonprofit organizations in Brockton and I'm sure somebody will be very happy to take your funds if you're willing to donate the funds uh, if one group isn't doing it there's plenty more that provides you know jobs for kids and some programming for other kids and 
uh, a variety of stuff. So I can't imagine an organization in the city. I mean, if they have it in their mission not to do anything to do with you know with cannabis, or whatever drug issues or whatever, it's one thing. But there's plenty of organizations in the city that we're willing to take your funds. Uh, I just had. I a can long, guarantee you that one. Oh, I'm sure. But I've had a long uh, working relationship uh, with Teen Challenge. Um, their students were my employees over at the Camp Hell Keith Oil Company for over 35 years, and I'd like to keep that relationship going. They I, do a lot of good. I understand that, but if it's, their, if, it's, if it's in their mission not to do that or through uh, you know, their works and stuff not to do that, form relationships with other organizations in this community. Well, again, uh, they're based basically out of Connecticut. They yeah. have six other locations, and their board of directors are not from Massachusetts. Yeah. But the Teen Challenge branch that I would want to donate to would be the Brockton branch. Yep. The people in Connecticut are not familiar with the industry here. They haven't educated themselves. They, it hasn't been brought up in their state. Um, so, therefore, they're not really knowledgeable about, you know, how this really works. But, again, um, if it was all possible that I could know that an organization, because I have to, by my commitment um, to the mayor, uh, when I received my host agreement that I would donate the $25,000 each year to this organization, he was all aboard on that. Now I find out that I have to deviate from my original plan, but do I really have to? And again, when you brought up about maybe talk about some sort of pool that this organize that cannabis industry people could donate to, which I'd be more than willing to do and love to do, and probably would do more than the $25,000. Um, but again, I don't have that avenue yet, and I didn't know if that discussion just fell by the boards. Or are you still discussing discussing it? Or that's all I really wanted to know. Oh, would you discuss we'll, we'll, it? We will, Gary. Definitely. That's all I really did. And Ladies and gentlemen, I, I first of all I want to thank Brockton Community Access for filming this tonight. I want to thank again Sandy Proctor, the residents of Sullivan Towers, the Housing Authority, and everybody that came out tonight. Uh, it was a spirited discussion, absolutely. We don't always agree on everything. And if I was talking too loud, I do, I do apologize. <laughs> My wife says I talk loud, so maybe I do. Uh, but again, on behalf of Gene, uh, the President Moses, myself, and Wynn, thank you. And we'll see you again. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.